morning, everyone, and welcome to the first in a series of training webinars being facilitated by Link Caribbean. The topic for today's session is how to assess your company like an investor. The presenter will be Mike Lightman. Um, if any one of you had tuned in to either of the two webinars held a couple of weeks ago, you would have seen Mike present briefly on this topic, and we had indicated that we would go um, a lot deeper into this topic. So this is what we plan to do today. Um, again, my name is Damien Sorendo. I'm the project coordinator. Um, just in terms of this session, we will be recording it as we did for the, um, the last webinar. So if for whatever reason you have to leave or you have to sign out briefly, um, this will be recorded and a link to the recorded session will be provided to everyone who's registered for the webinar um, sometime next week. And everyone will also receive a copy of Mike's presentation. So having said that, um, handing over to you, Mike. Thank you kindly, Damien. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us at 10 o'clock in the morning on Friday. I'm sure all of you have got busy days and kind of want to end things early. Um, so just a, a brief before we dive into it, I want to let you know the style of this presentation. I like to make it as engaging as possible. We have a tremendous amount of material to go through. So I'm going to try and breeze through it, but I want to leave a lot of time in the end for Q&A. Um, and one other thing that I want to bring up before we dive in is, and as you'll see, I currently work with the World Bank, but I, I want to be very clear that in this kind of a presentation, I'm not coming at it from a World Bank perspective, but as an investor. So as I answer any questions or any political incorrectness I have or anything else, understand that you know if you disagree with me, that's okay. I'm not saying this as a World Bank person. I'm saying this from my personal experiences. So really, if you ever get mad at somebody, get mad at me. And if you have any questions about the program specifically or your qualifications for things from a formal perspective, um, at the very end, the team for Link will be able to answer those questions. And if you're really looking for my personal perspective on it, but not telling you definitively how the program will look at it, then that's how I will be answering everything. So just diving in, um, I want to jump into the table of contents, what we'll be talking about today. And really, we have four things. Really, who am I, which will be very brief. I want to talk about a high level, what investors are looking for and how they look at your company. And then really that self-assessment checklist that you can go through. We'll have 11 items to talk about there. And at the very end, just kind of a recap, what's the best position for you to be in, some Q&A, some suggested reading. Um, and as we go through, you'll see there's the question itself. And then after that, there will be some additional details that, and additional articles that you can read for each one of these items in the checklist. So mind you, this presentation will be shared with you afterwards, and you'll be able to read everything in more depth. So today is still going to be a bit of a running through everything as quickly as we can with the option of you reading everything later. I guess the last piece that I'll just mention is, as you have any questions, um, I have this list in front of me. So comments, questions. Um, feel free to type them out as we're going, and if you want to wait until the very end, um, we can do that as well. So I'm pretty easy depending on how engaging you really want to be. So starting with who am I? Um, my name is Mike Lightman. I work with the World Bank in innovation and entrepreneurship, and generally we have a program called InfoDev where we work on supporting startup ecosystems currently in seven different countries. And there's a bit of a caveat and because one of those countries is really 14 countries across the Caribbean. Um, five of them are across Africa, and then one of them is in Vietnam. This is currently. Um, and essentially, the design of this program is to be 50% standardized. So your Silicon Valley, your New York Cities, your Berlins, they all have a lot of things in common. So we want to make sure that we catch a lot of those, but then we also want to look at what's going on, what are the comparative advantages of any particular country, what is the entrepreneurial culture. And we want to make sure that whatever we're doing, it actually fits in, because Silicon Valley is not going to work in every location, but other things might. So my job within that is almost as an entrepreneur in residence, and I work with these various programs, um, and my job is to kind of look at some of the design, redesign it, support teams, and directly support entrepreneurs, amongst whatever else. Um, so how did I get here? You'll see these are the fun yellow um, boxes. So I kicked off my career in the Peace Corps where I did small business development. Really, I ended up designing a few startup companies in Morocco and taught local entrepreneurs how to build these companies. They were not high tech, they were just scalable companies. 
from there, I worked in sales for a little bit. I got my MBA. I worked in venture capital. Um, and then I eventually uh, got a job at an incubator in New York City. And very quickly after, I became the director of that incubator. Um, I had a couple of really good success stories, like a Shark Tank record breaker, a TechCrunch Disrupt winner, and then a lot of the other things that you generally see. Um, so I will say a lot of my background really focuses on hardware technology. Um, and this is really across the board for a few industries. Not to say that I haven't seen dozens, if not hundreds, of fintech and uh, social apps and everything else, but um, I would say that the majority of my experience is in hardware. So in my free time, um, when I'm not doing World Bank things and I'm still trying to stay in the world of startups, I am an advisor to a group called UrbanX, which is a smart city accelerator in New York City, uh, 1776, which is a global incubator program. And I'm an entrepreneur in residence with Hacks, which is a hardware prototyping for robotics, Internet of Things, medical devices based in Shenzhen. Um, I also advise a few startups on the side. So for fun, when I'm not doing any of those things, I like running. I really like bourbon, scotch, and beer. And if you ever see me and you just feel inclined to buy me anything, um, my favorite bourbon is Basil Hayden and my favorite scotch is Lagavulin, just in case uh, we meet each other at the bar. Um, I do read a lot as long as it's not educational. And I am getting married in a few months. So I would say really you can almost scratch off everything I just said because half of my life is just wedding planning. Um, so anyway, let's actually dive into the stuff that you guys care about, which is what investors look for. So when you are going in front of an investor, really there's a couple of basic items that you have to have with you. So step one, when you're applying, you have to have an executive summary. And there's generally a style in which you do that. So think about it this way. When you go on a first date with somebody, you might have something deep down that you want to find out. Is this person marriage material? Or is this the kind of person that I can show in front of my family? But generally, you don't just walk in front of those people um, you generally don't walk in front of those people and just say, hi, um, first date, are you going to marry me? No, 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 you have to go through a myriad of steps and multiple dates and conversations and everything else. And it's kind of the same thing when you go in front of an investor. So really like you have problem, solution, value proposition, market, go to market, um, business model, you have your product competitive advantage, your um, your long-term competitive advantage, existing competitors, your finances, your operational timeline, et cetera, et cetera. And really the investor is going to boil all that down, and I'll talk about this in the next slide, and do a few things. But really, how do you present it? Number one, you want an executive summary. And that's one, maybe two pages that talks about high level, the problem that's in the market, the solution that you're proposing, the quantified value that that customer sees, the market, your current status, what you're raising, and a few other things. There are a lot of examples online. I think we've got some links to examples in here, but that needs to be included. And you also have to have a pitch deck, which is everything that I just talked about, but in more detail that allows you to connect the dots behind that strategy. When you actually go in front of your investor, when you're invited and so you'll, you'll apply, whatever happens, you'll go in front of the investor. You'll normally have about 15 minutes to pitch. You'll go through all the things in the deck, and then oftentimes, if your product is already developed, you'll want to show it to the investor. So be sure that you, you know, ideally, you want to be able to show them a demo. And then finally, if an investor is really happy with you and they want to move forward, they'll begin going through due diligence. That's when it's going to be expected that you provide customer introductions. Because at the end of the day, the investor's job is, your, is to not believe anything that you say, and your job is to convince them. So they might be very excited about what you're doing, but fundamentally, it's their money. Like they, they should not believe anything that you say until it's proven. So kind of with that in mind, they'll want to speak with your customers, and they'll want to get a better understanding from industry experts about the product or solution that you have. They'll definitely want to see your financials, because at the end of the day, it's a money play. They have to see a lot of their money back, and we'll talk about that in detail in a little bit. And it's pretty likely that you'll answer thousands of questions. So one more thing that I didn't include on this deck is you really want to be able to accommodate about six months to fundraise. Even if it's $50,000 to a million dollars, it's a full-time job for somebody on your team to go in front of investors, to answer these questions, to update all of the pretty things that they see. And that means that your business is probably not going to be operating for that time. So also think about this if you're raising money now, and then you need to raise money again in a year or two years. That's about a year's worth of time that you're not doing business. So 
what is an investor actually looking for? Um, and there, I would say there are four big categories. The first one is market. And this is like that, that secret list that they're doing on their own on the back end. And I define market in two ways. Number one, is it nice to have or is it need to have? Oftentimes those are going to be like the need to have is that regulatory pull. There is a legal explanation as to why somebody has to buy it. Like recycling, it's binary. Either it's nice to have and people may or may not do it or they might do it if they're good people. But if they legally don't have to, there's nothing drawing it. But if you are legally required to buy a recycling bin and you make recycling bins, that looks pretty good for your company. The other end of it is, if you sold this to every possible person you could sell it to, how much money would you make? And that's just looking at your entire addressable market, how much you sell it to, and fundamentally how much money will come out of that. The next piece that I think is really important is the competitive advantage. And once again, I really break this into two things. I say first and foremost, why are you a special and unique snowflake today? in the sense of how are you different? And there's a couple of different ways that this is done, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, but one of them is this big chart that's got check marks, and it has a different benefit or feature. And that's not really, in my mind, a competitive advantage so much as it is a unique prospect, which is good in the short run, but that is the other part of this competitive advantage. Number two is a year or two years from now, when you are just knocking it out of the park, you're doing incredibly well, If me or somebody else gave your competitor a bag of cash, how are you going to stay ahead of them? And once again, we'll talk about what some of those are in the future, but those are the two pieces of competitive advantage. Third, and I would argue, hands down, the most important thing is your team. And there's this weird combination that investors wanna look for. They wanna see kind of an inventor, a salesperson, a cult leader, a drinking buddy, somebody they can show to their parents, you know, basically somebody that they, the relationship with, I was reading this a couple of days ago, oftentimes the relationship that somebody has with their investor can be longer than that with their spouse. So this has got to be somebody that you can trust and you can be frank with, that you just have a very natural relationship with. And then finally, um, this is kind of that binary, is the investor ROI, the return on investment. So once again, we'll talk about this in the future, but fundamentally, the equity investor has to see three to 10 X the return within five to 10 years. So they have to believe that, that your company, when it becomes liquid, is going to provide that kind of return. So for instance, if I give you $100,000, I need to basically almost guarantee that you can give me 300,000 to a million within 10 years from now. So, this is how I would assess folks as an investor. And it doesn't necessarily mean this is what everybody does, but just to kind of go into the, the, the back end and the insight. Step one, I'm going to go through your slide deck and your strategy to get a better understanding of how you position your strategy, your operations, and your finances, and kind of your step-by-step your -step logic. And then from there, I'm going to build, I'm gonna forget everything you told me, and I'm going to build an imaginary version of your company basically doing as much research as I can, contacting my friends, my business partners, whoever else, and literally rebuilding your company separate to yours and seeing how I would do it. With the theory of, and this is like a proverbial me, the theory is my friends my and my contacts have got a breadth and a depth of experience that a lot of entrepreneurs simply don't have. Um, just and not to say that they're incapable, but it's just more a matter of time and experience than it is anything else. So the idea is that my imaginary company is the right way to do it, and your imaginary company is then going to be compared to the one that I've made. Now, if there's a big discrepancy, then I'm going to, to really ask that team if they can make any adjustments. That being said, if you happen to know a lot more about the industry and truly genuinely know more than me, that's okay. And that's really where it boils down to team. But just kind of keep in mind that whatever it is that you send to an investor, they're not going to believe it. And they're going to put stress tests and war games on that strategy. And they're fundamentally only going to go with the things that they believe are true, not necessarily you saying, trust me, I know this better than you. So it's always, it's nice to persuade an investor, but if for some reason they don't believe you, that's a red flag and you wanna do everything in your power to understand why and to adjust appropriately.
And then finally, this last piece is the decision. They look at the finances, the exit opportunities, dilution, which we'll talk about later. And if the money looks good, they make a decision. So that is kind of a very high level. Who, what are investors looking for? What's the process? What should you have ready to go? Um, and now let's talk about that checklist for things that you want to look at when you're looking at your own company like an investor would. And I break this down to just a simple 11 items. Actually, some of them are a little bit simple. And you can see this is color coded. So there are fundamentally three different areas that we can talk about today. The first one in yellow, these are a lot of the basics, the binaries. These are the very simple, either I'm doing this and I'm okay with this and life is good, or I'm not and I should really think about getting investment from another perspective. The green one, which is probably the most important to me, is my current operational status. How far along am I in whatever it is that I'm doing? And then finally, the light blue, these are the business items. And there are a lot more than that, but these are really the important ones that the business strategy and the linking all these items together should look like in the status in which you're at. So without further ado, let's dive into the investment prep piece. Um, so this is probably the easiest of all of them. I mean, relatively straightforward. Are you incorporated or registered? And are you in the Caribbean? Um, so the incorporated or registered piece is a legal item. Um, and this is just very important from the lawyers and the tax perspective and everything else is that when an investor is putting money into your company, they're receiving equity or shares or percentage ownership of the company. And there needs to be a legal, um, and your, your company cannot be a private one. It cannot be something on paper. It has to be a legal entity that's capable of giving those shares out. That's just how it's done. Um, it's not terribly expensive to do. And depending on where you're located, we even have resources and, and support to help you do that. Uh, but basically, in order to do this, um, you need to be incorporated. I added, are you in the Caribbean simply for the link program, which we've talked about before, and we can go into more detail later. But in order to kind of get the additional support that we're capable of providing, you do need to be based in the Caribbean and have a market in the Caribbean. So very easy, strong fit, yes, or we'll do it very soon. Not so good of a fit is we're not going to incorporate or we're not going to be in the Caribbean. Now, you'll see this. I've got a little bit of a Q&A after each one of these slides. Um, I'm going to spare you just the, the boringness of me reading these words out loud to you. You'll get a lot of this. You get all of these slides later. You can go through. You can read the additional reading, Q&A. We can go through all of that. So the next one is, are you fundraising? Um, so fundraising can really mean a couple of different things, right? So there is, um, it could be taking a loan from a bank. So you might need project financing, you might need corporate financing. So project financing is if you manufacture products or let's just go with you manufacture products and you need in order to sell your contract to X number of people, you need to have Y number of dollars to manufacture and distribute. And if the customer isn't willing to pay up front, that puts you at this kind of a, an arbitrage or a weakness opportunity where you don't have enough money, even if you have the cash in or the, the customer contract, you don't have the cash in hand. So some people will go to a bank and get project financing to fill in the gap. Normally that's very short, very easy. Terms are very straightforward. Um, not to say it's super easy, but that's going to be a bank loan and they're going to give you a fixed percentage. That is not what we're talking about. We're talking generally in this about corporate financing, which is my company is going to grow exponentially. Some of our financing might go towards developing the product or even doing a few customer um, contracts. But for the most part, this is to do our branding, our internal development, hiring our team, building our product, hitting the pavement, doing sales. And basically we are growing, we might even be in revenue, but we don't have enough money to be sustainable. So generally speaking, there, there's a whole conversation that we can have later about the different types of, um, of series. So generally, if you do not have a product yet, you're considered pre-seed to seed, and you will be giving, um, maybe you're raising 50,000 to a million, and then Series A is generally defined as something once you're in revenue and you want to go from your first market to your next markets. And then Series B and beyond are generally you're raising 
five, maybe $10 million, and you're going from one or two markets to across multiple countries. Um, these are very broad terms, um, but generally when you're speaking with an investor and you say, I'm raising a series A, they might think, okay, you're raising one to five million, and this is the expectation um, for the where the money will go. So generally, I'm going to make an assumption and say that most of the folks in the webinar today are looking to raise pre-seed to seed funding, which like I said, is probably going to be anywhere from 50,000 US dollars to a million dollars. Um, and ultimately, you know, the big things that will change depending on where you're fundraising is the use of funds might be modified, your burn rate, which is how quickly you'll go through the money per month, and a few others. But for the most part, um, yeah, for the most part, you can go after any stage. Like me talking about pre-seed to seed, and you're raising a Series B doesn't disqualify from everything we're talking about. Anyway, I've talked way too long on fundraising. Basically, once again, this is binary. Are you raising money? The answer is yes, you're great. If you might need money in the future, great. If you wanna do it internally, well, you probably didn't sign up for this webinar. Um, the only other thing that I would say regarding fundraising is, and this is probably the most important, if you can, go to your investor before you're actually raising the money. Begin building the relationship and say, hi, I plan on raising money in the next six months. I wanted to introduce myself and begin this opportunity now. And then we can talk about more things in the later. So like the less desperate you are generally, the better off you are. Fundraising Q&A, blah, blah, blah. How do you feel about giving away equity? Equity is part ownership in the company. So it is illiquid. The idea is, Oftentimes with a bank loan, they're saying, here's the base amount of money. It's $100,000. Let's say it's a 10% interest. Let's just make it simple. It's So next year, you owe me $110,000. Boom. With equity, it's a lot different because I'm giving you $100,000 and I'm saying your company is worth a certain amount, which is the valuation. And depending on what that valuation is, that determines how much percentage of your company I own. So if I give you $100,000 and I say your company is worth $1 million post my investment, that means I get 10% ownership. That's fine, that's very standard. I mean, the, the valuation is, is always negotiable, but um, the thing to keep in mind about that is um, when the company becomes liquid, so when you get an exit, that means that the investor is going to be getting all of their money before you. There are all kinds of other terms that go into equity in addition to just the ownership that determine the speed at which you get it. So they might ask for preferred equity um, or liquidation rights. And just to simplify, to guarantee that an investor is getting their three to 10X return, let's say that you exit for some amazing amount of money, what the investor is going to do is say, I want all the money I gave you back before anybody else sees any of it. And then oftentimes I want to get just, let's say, 2x on top of that. And then after I've gotten 3x based off my investment, you'll be able to split the remaining money that's left over. So that is kind of common. And just keep in mind that even, even if you say my valuation is this, that doesn't stop an investor from getting the amount of money that they want to get back based off the terms. So there's a lot more that we can read about on this. Um, there's a few book recommendations that really dive into equity and term sheets that give you a little bit more understanding on it. But the next one, which I think is almost equally important, if not more, is how do you feel about an investor having control of your company? So generally speaking, this goes back to the, the idea that an investor is probably excited about what you're doing and they want you to be successful, but it's their job to not believe that you're going to be successful. Um, and your job to prove to them that they are. And I'm, very, very, I'm being very blunt about this um, and politically incorrect, and there's, there are obviously nuances. But generally speaking, because they're putting money into your company, they wanna make sure that they can ascertain some control over the decisions that you make and that their money is not spent in vain. So how do they do that? They generally make sure legally that you have to have a board of directors on your company. So. Early stage, you'll generally see three. It will be one of the founders, your investor, and a neutral party. And it will be set into the term sheet that whenever X things happen, 
a board has to vote on it. So it could be something as um, you know, a complex as hiring a new team member, developing a new product, identifying new markets and going into them. Or it could be something a lot simpler, like, uh, well, I mean, I'm going to be a little bit facetious here, but like, what are we going to do for our holiday party or ordering lunch? And your investors might be able to influence that. So generally speaking, very direct, you know, if this is something that you're looking for, if your response is, I want somebody with a breadth and depth of experience who can add all kinds of um, wonderful things to my company, that's great because they have, they have a direct, um, oh my gosh, my words fail me, um, stake in what your company is doing and they want to see you be successful. So oftentimes it's really good for them to have this board seat. But if you're not quite ready for that yet and you still have a very strong vision and you're concerned that the investor might see it another way, you might want to hold off on receiving investment. Uh, once again, ton of information on that. Um, and then I believe this is our last one in these basic ideas behind investing and whether or not investing is the right path for you. How will my company exit? So think about this. If you are a software company, even a hardware company, your value is not real. It, it, you know, it's perceived, but it's not like a house which you can sell on the market or your bank account which you can liquidate. Your company is still just only as valuable as you think it is or as somebody is willing to pay for it. So from these like five to 10 years down the road, you have to think about how am I going to get my money and how is my investor going to get their three to 10x return? And generally speaking, there are three ways that this happens. The two first ones are the really, really kind of standard. One of them is an initial public offering. You can look up Snap or Snapchat, which just did this. Um, I know the Jamaican Stock Exchange is quite active now. And essentially, this is you going onto a public market and saying, my company was private. All the ownership shares were divided amongst the following people, but now I'm going to make it public. So anybody is capable of buying the shares that I have, and the idea is the market will then flood in, they'll see this great growth opportunity, and then because somebody is paying to have public shares, you can now sell your shares, and voila, there's uh, literally a market where you can sell your company on. Um, the other one is to be, and this is probably much more common, is to be acquired. There's some organization out there that sees a lot of value in what they're doing, and instead of them just competing against you and building up a competitor and going through it, it's easier and cheaper and more convenient for them to buy you. Excuse me. And they'll make an offer of some money and some guarantees for your employees and everything else, and you can move. Um, and then you'll be bought out, and that's, that cash will then be given and shared amongst the investors and employees and founders. The only other one that I've seen is for really cash flush businesses to pay back dividends. And the idea might be, I'll give you $100,000 and I'll say, I want to see for every dollar you make, I want one penny of it up until you pay me back 3x my return, which is $300,000. Um, this is becoming a little bit more common. It's a bit of a dangerous thing to do depending on your revenue. Um, but it is also an option depending on the approach that both your investor and you like. Um, so when you're doing the exit, when you're going in front of the investors, once again, it's one thing for you to say, I know I'm gonna get this, I know the company, my the value of my company is really high, An investor says, I don't care, I want proof. So it's your responsibility to look up what are similar companies to mine that have IPO'd or been acquired, um, similar industries, or just similar backgrounds or just anything, even if it's a weighted average, and I know they're only 50% like my company, this is what they've done. And you'll need to prove that to them and say, this company was around for this long, they were in this much revenue before this offer was made to them. And you wanna be able to show with evidence that the investor can get, let's just say five times their investment. Um, so there are resources you can find that are public that will give you access. One of them, to keep in mind, I don't know if I have it on the slide later, one of them is called Crunchbase. Um, phenomenal resource, I cannot recommend using it. More, like, incredible resource. So basically, an audit of your company, if you believe that you'll be able to exit on the, on the stock market or that somebody will be willing to spend a lot of money to buy your company, or you can do the revenue-based payments, you might be a 
grand fit for raising money. If you're not sure or you don't have evidence, it's going to be more difficult to convince an investor to move forward with you. So, more questions on that. My favorite part, which is current status. <clears throat> um, so I always think about it, really, the, the perspective of the business as it's this giant three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle where you have to fit in, like, who's the person that's got this problem and how bad is the problem and then how do I get to them and, you know, how much money will I have after the lifetime value of customer minus the cost of customer acquisition. And then all of that normally makes a lot of logical sense. But when it actually begins happening, there are always kinks in the road. So one of the, the biggest indicators of future success for an investor is how far along have you gone? Um, have you taken risks on your own? Have you invested your own money into the company? And even with or without the amount of money you might have invested, how much progress have you made? And the further the progress is, the better the likelihood of you receiving investment money. So there are three areas. Let's dive into paying customers. This is my favorite one. I'm in some of the absolute best companies that I've ever worked with. Um, they have had paying customers before they've developed their product. So they literally knew the pain so bad and they understood the market so well, that they knocked down doors and said, you need this product, I need you to buy it, and it won't be available for six months, but these were folks that were still willing to pay you know, up to $10,000 a month, both to pay for the development of the product and to have access to the product later. So really, this is number one, is if you have any paying customers, especially before your product is developed, you're in a fantastic spot. Um, you know, and you, we can see this category of strong, medium, poor. Um, if we have the paying customers, great. Even if the product isn't built, we've got signed customer contracts, great. Now, I realize how insanely difficult that is um, for most companies. So if you can get a letter of intent, from customers or a letter of interest, which are almost interchangeable, that's also very powerful. And like we talked about earlier, the investor is going to want to speak with the customer and understand why is this something that you care about that you want to buy. So that's the purpose of that. And really, if your business model is super complex, but you have confirmation from customers, like you're a two-sided market um, and you need advertisers once you hit a certain amount of users on the base, if you can get the advertisers to say, yes, we would do this, we would pay this much money for it, we like it, that's also fantastic. Um, generally speaking, you're not going to be in as strong as a spot. If you haven't spoken to your customers yet, if it's, well, you know, I've got a couple of friends in this area and I know that there's demand, but I haven't proven it. Um, if you don't have any commitment at all from customers, that's also trouble. And then finally, really that like our business model is complex, but once we build it, um, customers will come. Like I will build it, they will come, trust me. Like I said, and like I, you know, I, I continuously will say, I can't trust you. It's not that I don't like you, it's not that I don't want to trust you, I think that you're wonderful and I really want to hang out with you and I'm excited about what you're doing, but I don't believe you on the viability of it until I actually see it happen. Um, and this oftentimes brings kind of this chicken or egg problem, which is, well, I can't, I can't sell anything until I have a product and I can't have a product until I have investment money and I can't get investment money until I have my paying customers. Um, and Really, most investors will say, too bad. Like, I'm not taking that risk on you. There are always exceptions. Um, and that's one of the reasons that this program exists is to say, we see the opportunity. And just in case investors are uh, a little bit more reluctant to make investments, we want to help with that chicken egg problem. But I would not rely on that for long term and future companies that you do and everything else. So really cannot stress this enough. If you have paying customers, you are probably in a phenomenal spot to raise money. The next one is how developed is my product? Um, I am not a product guy. I am a business guy. So I will always get a second opinion on really everything that I'm saying, but especially on this. Um, for me, there's this thing called the minimum viable product. And I define it as what is the worst version of the product that A, will work, and B, a customer is willing to pay one dollar for like it could be almost nothing but 
that the customer has enough interest to actually try it out. So generally speaking, when you go in front of an investor, you want to have that MVP built. And I literally just told you an example when that didn't happen. Um, so there are obviously exceptions. But generally speaking, um, I see a lot of people that really focus very heavily on product development and not as much on market development. And I would say that's great, but make sure that you're doing equal and realistically an MVP, which is no frills, no benefits, nothing else, is generally more than enough. Um, so really, uh, you know, kind of somewhat contradicting what I'm putting on the slide, I would say as long as your product, you've got the, the framework for the MVP, you've got the MVP being built, or just a little bit closer to that, you're generally going to be okay. Um, the only time with this is a problem is when somebody says, I don't have an MVP, I don't have a product, I need your money to build my experiment. And generally speaking, unless you've got customers lined up, the investor's gonna say, walk out. Like, thank you, have a good life. Finally, we go back to team. This first bullet I have in strong fit is probably, if you, if you listen to nothing else that I say today, remember this, you want to have more than one founder. Um, so there are a couple of ways to say it, I'll take the uncouth method and say, what happens if you have a heart attack tomorrow or you're hit by a bus? The entire investment, the entire company disappears. So in that downside protection, at the very least, you need another partner that has ownership of it to drive the legacy of what you're doing. Kind of a nicer way to say this and a little bit less extreme way to say this is, you really wanna have one person on the team that understands the market, one person on the team that understands the tech side of things. And you want them to constantly be challenging each other and pushing each other and balancing each other. Um, and that dynamic is really important for investors to see. So almost all investors will require at minimum a team and not a single founder. And kind of I mentioned the balance between tech and business. The other thing that is huge is the company has to have a full-time commitment. And I understand a lot of times people, they'll do this on the side, they'll get some viability, and then they'll go to investors to say, I actually need some money to make sure that my team can commit to this full-time. That's okay. But there needs to be an indication that either now or once money is raised, there will be full-time commitment from the founders and ideally the rest of the team towards this. Um, and then the last piece is, there's a board of advisors. And this is slightly different than the board, the management board. The management board actually makes decisions and has authority. The board of advisors is developed to bring a degree of expertise that the company doesn't have, and really to help open doors to areas that the company wants access to. So you're really looking for big name people that you have family connections with, or something else, or an old professor that will allow you to get access and add benefit to your company. Now they're not supposed to be doing work, but they're supposed to help you out occasionally. Um, and you gen generally want that to be as diverse as possible. One professor, one family member, one something else. Um, so that's really your strong fit for the team. Still good as a single founder, but looking for a co-founder, you're missing either business or tech, but you're actively hiring and you understand. You only have one full time right now. There's no board yet. Look, that's fine, it's variable. Oftentimes angel investors wanna join your board or they might wanna join your team. So don't worry if you don't have it, but just be ready to preempt that and answer those questions when you go in front of an investor. Um, and generally speaking, a lot of investors will just walk away if they see a single founder, um, or if there's only a part-time commitment, or if critical talent is missing. Like if there's no sign that a business person is joining a tech team in the future, they might not even consider it. So really, those are the three items on the current status. And once again, plenty of articles, plenty of future reading on it. I just wanna breeze through to make sure that we've got some time for Q&A. Um, finally, long-term business strategy. This is, so we've done like the, the binary piece, the ops piece, now it's that logic that goes behind the development of the company. And almost that, is this a good company or is this not going to be a good company? And we look, I look at this in three ways. The market size, the go-to-market strategy, and your unique competitive advantage. So how big is my market? There are two ways you can look at market development. One of them is top down, and that is saying, if I, um, the total market for tourism in the Caribbean annually is, 
let's just say $1 billion. So all I need from that, you know, my app does X, Y, and Z, and all I need is 0.001%, and I'm gonna be rolling in money. That's top down. Generally speaking, investors don't care about that. Um, it's nice to know that the industry is real, it's nice to know that the industry is growing, but that imaginary percentage, you know, you could just, you're pulling a number out of thin air, and that's not enough evidence that your company will be successful. So generally what they wanna see is this idea of, if who are my customer demographics? So what are the purchasing patterns of these homogenous types of people that I can really attract in a particular way? Um, and if I were then to sell this product or solution to every possible person I could sell it to, how much money will I have? And then, you know, if you want to get fancy, you can say this demographic has this likelihood to respond to whatever our branding and go-to-market strategy is. Therefore, we believe we can convert the following people, even based off of evidence. And that way you say, you know, even if everything you have is a hypothesis, there is more detail and more ability for adjustment as you go. So really, when they're looking at market, they want to see, um, ideally, global markets, just insane amounts of revenue, um, and a, a good understanding of who the market demographics are and how they're broken down. Look, realistically, um, those are unicorns. I think a lot of investors are very happy with, we can have reoccurring revenue every year, it's going to be good revenue, and the company will be successful, potentially bought out, maybe IPO, definitely the opportunity to have this revenue-based financing. Um, and that's great, and oftentimes that's just, if your solution is applicable across the Caribbean and maybe a few other spots, wonderful. The only time this could really be a problem is if it's a very niche market, which means that there aren't a lot of customers that exist. Um, even if the, the price point is high, you know, you're multiplying the business model by the total number of customers. Um, it, that number, you know, will really be dependent on, on what the, the likelihood of investment will depend on that. I would say also if the answer is, well, we're really only applicable in a few spots around the Caribbean. And I'm not saying applicable so much as I'm saying buying customer demographics that I have proven. Not just I think they'll do it, but I know definitively that this is an area where we can make money. So that's how, you know, once again, high level, how an investor is going to look at your market. Here's some more reading material. Um, next one is go to market. This for me is just as important. Um, <clears throat> and that is having a comprehensive go to market strategy that ultimately ties in with the financial projections. So, okay, that's a lot. What does that actually mean? The first one is what is the cost of customer acquisition? So let's think about it this way. If you are a B2B sales company, you probably have to have at least one salesperson. So cost of customer acquisition, part of that is, what is the salary for my salesperson? What's the commission my salesperson needs? And how much time will it take for them to close that customer and me to get that contract? All of that will go into cost of customer acquisition. If you're a two-sided marketplace doing social media things with um, re relying on advertising, well, part of it is, how do you get the one user demographic on there? How do you add the content on there? And what's the cost of using, let's say, Facebook media or Twitter or anything else, branding strategies, developing all the, the marketing material that you can then either have as a fixed cost that's broken out or the variable cost that says, I know for each customer I need to spend this much money to really get them on board. The other piece that's gonna be really important for this is the lifetime value of customer. Um, and there are really complex MBA type models that you can use, but I would really just say, for me, is this a one-time purchase? Is this a multiple purchase? Uh, if it's one time, then the lifetime value is literally the price of the product. Um, if it is ongoing, you know, there will be some drop off, but fundamentally, how much do you think that they'll buy over the lifetime of them continuing to buy? set a number at the very end of it, they'll buy it for 10 years, boom, and you've got that number. And then you can plug that right into the financials. Um, and really, if once again, if you wanna get fancy, you do cost of customer acquisition, lifetime value, based off your various customer demographics, and then tying that in with the appropriate go-to-market strategy. And one thing I've seen, and this is kind of the difference between a lot of the really, really good folks that get money quickly and the folks that struggle, 
are a go-to-market strategy includes actionable items. It includes specifics. It includes financials. It's an entire strategy in and of itself. So that is what's going to be in a great go-to-market strategy. Sometimes the not as great strategies are the ones that are sent back are, we're going to go to trade shows. We're going to do online advertising. Yes, those are all methods to do go-to-market strategies, but they are not the specifics of how you're going to do it. How frequently will you send Facebook messages? Who is your demographic? How, when will you adjust and pivot your marketing strategy if and when you need to? So the more detail you have about the go-to-market and kind of, I, kind of ironically or hypocritically, the more you're also showing a willingness to adjust as you learn more, the better off you are. And even if you don't know your cost of customer acquisition or your lifetime value and you haven't done the in-depth demographic, if you're indicating that you have an idea of what it is and that this is your working hypothesis, generally an investor is willing to move forward. Because going back to the very beginning of this, we were talking about what is an investor going to do? Well, they're going to say, this is how I'm going to build it. And if an investor doesn't know, they'll just say, I don't know, I would find out in the following way. Which if they see you saying, I don't know, this is what I think and this is how I'm planning on doing it, that's oftentimes a lot better than saying definitively, I'm going to do this, um, even if you have no idea if it's really what you're going to do or if it's going to work. So honesty is key in this. Um, and this is a really difficult piece. So don't be afraid also to ask your investor for additional context and support with getting to market and lining up those customers. Finally, what is my competitive advantage? Why am I a unique and special snowflake? And how am I going to continue to be a unique and special snowflake over time? So the first part, and I'm thinking to this presentation deck, is who are my competitors? What is their current market share? And what is my really like honest fear about what these guys are going to do um, if I enter the market? And then after that, I wanna say, let's just say I'm amazing, because we have to assume that you're amazing, otherwise, why are you doing this? Um, how am I going to keep these competitors from stealing from me. So there are some very definitive ways in which you can lock out competitors. Number one is intellectual property. Um, this, get a lot of opinions on this. I'm actually not huge on IP unless it's hardware. Um, different conversation, but that's one of the ways. A legally binding contract with very powerful customers that lasts over multiple years locking other people out is amazing. Um, another one is an economic advantage over your competition. Your uncle owns a manufacturing plant, so you get to manufacture below cost. Boom. Um, or something like, you know, we're, we're manufacturing so much that nobody can compete with us because we have economies of scale. Or a really unique team you brought in that has some degree of synergy with each other that nobody else can replicate because you're just so good. Um, things that are kind of competitive advantages but not necessarily super strong um, is it's difficult to copy or there's some degree of exclusivity over time. And then the ones that I would be a little bit more concerned about um, is that well, we have one unique or a few unique features over the competition. That goes back to that checkbox where, you know, one end of it, the Y axis is the, the name of competitors and the X axis is the various benefits and yours just has more checkbox over it. That's great. It might make you unique, but in a year from now, your competitor can probably copy it if they wanted to. Um, anything that's in the future, we will do this. Not a competitive advantage now. Um, competing over price, unless you have that economic competitive advantage, um, it's you cannot compete on price because you'll just end up going bankrupt. Um, and that's a very broad statement. We can argue that later. And then finally, first mover advantage. I love first mover advantage. It's great. That's you're the first one to market. Nobody else has ever done anything like it. Um, but that doesn't mean that your competitive advantage will retain over time. So it's good for now. And unless you see a quick exit, it's not going to be so good for later. So um, kind of we just went through all the items in the checklist. We've got additional reading material for later. We've got about 20 minutes left for Q&A. So just very quickly, I want to touch up on this. And then we can open the floor to questions. Looking at these 11 different items. If I were to snap my fingers and say, this is the perfect company, it would look like this. It's a legal entity, they're raising equity financing, they're more than fine to give away equity in fair terms, fair to both ends, they're more than willing to give away some control, fair terms, and there's a clear exit that they've researched, 
um, and there's evidence that it is feasible. The company has some revenue, that at minimum the MVP is built, and there's a strong team that is committed to this full time. Um, finally, huge market, just amazing opportunity to sell it globally. There's a very clear and articulate go-to-market strategy that ties into the finances, and there is a real and unique competitive advantage. So, um, that's a lot. What are some things that we can read? There's, excuse me, we've got four different categories here. First one is actually on building a startup. Um, my favorite is the Discipline Entrepreneur. It's very market development focused and understanding your customer. The Lean Startup is also amazing. Um, from market development, Originals is a really good read that talks about doing things generically versus how do you get that unique flair? Um, and how do you look at your company from a unique perspective? It isn't necessarily focused on startups, but it really talks about just unique individuals. And I think it's it's an amazing read, even if it's not going to be directly about a startup. Um, I do think that one that is a great read for your startup is the mom test. Basically, this former entrepreneur went out, um, he built a product, and all the feedback he got was from his peers who are like, oh, yeah, it's a great idea. I love it. And then when he actually built the company and launched, nobody bought it. And he called it the mom test, is that when you go in front of your mom, your mom loves you unconditionally. She's always going to say, I love what you're doing and you're going to be successful, honey, even if she hates the idea and will never buy it. So this book is fundamentally a checklist and a series of things that you can do to guarantee that you're not going to people that feed you the answers that you want to hear and that you're actually going for the most critical of critical people. From a fundraising perspective, Venture Deals by Brad Feld is amazing. It goes through all the items um, on the equity piece and on the, the term sheet piece and on the board control piece and really gives you the perspective of how an investor thinks and how an entrepreneur might want to approach it and the things that are important and aren't important. And if you really want to learn more about how the world of venture capital works and get into the mind of your investors, I would strongly check out The Business of Venture Capital. Um, it's a really good book. Um, it's a pretty dense read, so it's more of a reference than anything else, but I still go back to it. Finally, here's just a couple of really awesome blogs. Um, that they, always, they talk about everything, um, tech and fundraising and startups, but you see a lot of best practices on there. So I've got two more slides and then we'll open it up. Next steps. Um, this is going back to the link program, which we've talked about before. Just a, a basic brief overview is, you know, we've got, we, the link program has got fundamentally two programs. If you have a term sheet with an investor right now, you can come to link and there's no guarantee, but there's a, a high likelihood that we will match the funding that you get with a grant. So no equity on our end, and we'll give you 50% of the money that you have, that you're getting from your investor, up to $100,000. So you raise $200,000 from an investor, you and the investor come to us, the term sheets has to, be there, has to be there, but they cannot have given you the money already. So this is before the investment is actually made. They're investing, they're committed $200,000, we'll give you $100K as a gift. The other option is if you don't have an investor, you can apply onto the RAIN platform, which you can see on here. Um, RAIN is another fun acronym that we have um, that focuses more on the investor end of things, but you apply on the RAIN platform um, and pending you know, that your company is at the right stages and that the investors are interested in seeing you, we will basically introduce you to our friends that are investors um, who are mostly angel investors across the Caribbean. Um, and you know, best case scenario, they love you, they're gonna invest in you tomorrow, same deal as before. If instead they say, you're missing something, like your progress just isn't far enough along, I really wanna invest in you, but I need to see more, then you can qualify for an investment readiness grant where we give you about $25,000 that is used to basically get you to where you need to be to be investor ready. So that's the high level of the program. Here are the folks that you wanna reach out to, um, and they're also on the call and can answer the more applicable questions regarding that. Um, and then finally, kind of my, I wish I knew earlier, um, here are all the things that a lot of people wish they knew before they went in front of investors, and I'll just walk through them quickly. Do not shotgun your investor outreach. This is huge. Research your, 
investors will say no to you. They might love your company, but you might not fit their thesis. Every investor has their own unique thesis of what they're looking for. Try to identify the investors that would be most interested in you, that have made investments in similar companies, or express a desire to go in there. And that's the beauty of Crunchbase, which is what I mentioned earlier, is it gives you a list of the thesis, thesi, whatever, of the investors, and allows you to be much more uh, targeted with your outreach. Um, no cold calls. I know that this sometimes is an impossibility, but most of the investors that I've ever met, when I ask them, where did you get most of your deals from? They say, from somebody I knew referred them to me. Almost nobody, even though they have the application online, almost nobody ever makes an investment in cold applications. So try to find somebody that knows the investors that's willing to make that introduction for you. That is a huge difference. I hate superlatives. Um, this is me personally. So that idea of like, I see decks that are like, we are the first and the only and the best company that ever did this. That's your opinion, buddy. Um, it might be true, but you're trying to convince me to have that opinion. And as soon as you tell me what my opinion is supposed to be, I immediately hate you. And I immediately don't want to listen to what you have to say. So try to be as humble as you can and let drive, bring the investor to come to the superlative conclusion on their own without telling them that they should have it. Next one, team. Team, like hands down most important thing. I'm investing in you, even if I think your idea is terrible. I've seen investors make investment in people just because they really like them and they know that they'll make the appropriate adjustments in the future. Um, so make sure you've got just an amazing team. Be sure to say, I don't know when you don't know. Um, this is, this is like, once again, of all the truths that I hopefully I'm giving, this is another one of the, the high list. My interaction with VCs and angel investors are that oftentimes, not only are they some of the most successful people and smartest people, but they can just look through you and see your soul. When you lie and when you bullshit about things, they know. I don't know how they know, they just know. So as soon as that lie detector goes off or that bullshit meter goes off, you're out. So be as honest and as transparent as much as you can. Remember, valuation isn't set, as I mentioned, Look, you could have an insanely great valuation for yourself. A, it might hurt you in future raises, but that's a different conversation. But B, the investor can just set up terms that say, I get liquidation preference, I get preferred, and I want a 3x return on everything. So your valuation, like they might have like 1% of the company, but they're still guaranteed to get all the money they want back, and you might still lose out in the end. So valuation is not the only important piece, and know which battles to pick and choose. Um, and the last one, your revenue projections are never accurate. The The idea of the finances when an investor asks for it early stage, they're not to see how much money you're gonna make and not to see that hockey stick and not to, you know, not to have your personal guarantee that the company will be successful. It's to see how you think. And it's to see if you're going about it by identifying your market demographics and your go-to-market and plugging everything in. And if it's realistic, or if you're just trying to spin me a story. So keep that in mind that, uh, like all of these things combined. Oh, one more, which I didn't include, is when you are raising, what you generally, and this is, this is a high level, it's not specific, um, but generally I'd say, if you're asking how much money should I raise, I say whatever your runway is for the next 18 months. And runway means the all of the costs that you will incur from salaries to developing your product, to your market development, to everything else, for a year and a half, assuming you have little to no revenue. Even if your plan is to have revenue, unless you have contracts signed, I'm assuming no revenue, that's how much money you wanna be raising for. So that worst case scenario, you don't sign the customer that you thought you were gonna sign, your company's not gonna go under and everything doesn't go to hell. So do you want a safety? Even if you're asking for more than you initially thought, that's okay. Okay, wow. Um, that went way longer than I thought. I apologize for having to sit through and listen to me for all of that. I want to open it up to questions. Um, you can type them in, or I think there's an option where you can raise your hand virtually, and then we give you the microphone and you can talk at us, and then we respond. So we'll just do whatever works. Damien, I'm going to let you manage that end, because um, it turns out I'm terrible at technology now. Okay, all right. Thanks a lot, uh, Mike. We actually do have... 
a question that came in from Khalil. I'm not sure if you can read it, but just to um, for everyone's oh, context, I understand. Is that the one? Yeah, that's the one. All right, give me a second. I'll read this out loud. I'm just bigger sizing this, which there we go. Context. I understand that usually an investment is a negotiation and a conversation. In the angel meetings that I've been to, the investors have not had that conversation. They either take out our valuation and leave it, or leave it. Additional context. We are raising 400,000 uh, BBD and they offer 300K BBD. It broke down when they thought we couldn't achieve our projections. We have since surpassed our projections with no investment, however, still need to raise money. Question. What can we do to prompt the conversation with the invested? Are we thinking about this conversation in the right way? Okay, so that's a really complex question and a really unfortunate situation. Um, and I'm going to say, I'm going to give you a two-part answer. Um, and I would just say, um, you know, this is Mike speaking. This is not the World Bank speaking. Number one is oftentimes when you are speaking with angel investors, these are not professional investors. They are independently wealthy people that want to make investments based off of whatever it is in their background. So oftentimes all of the training items that we've just walked through, they may or may not know. Um, so when you're going in front of a venture capitalist, like they have people whose full-time job is to screen in a very particular manner. Oftentimes angel investors, they'll get excited about things, they'll look at things in a particular way. Um, so it's a whole different type of conversation. And I want to be clear, I'm not saying that they're not professionals, they're not, but their their approach is much different. So oftentimes, you know, prepping to go in front of an angel is going to be different than prepping to go in front of a venture capitalist. And that will tie into my next piece, is that if they're saying, we don't believe you can do this, I think the absolute best thing that you can do is write out your business milestones. Not the hiring and the anything internal, but the actual business items that they don't believe you on. And that's where you have a conversation with them over time. And you send them updates and say, you know, as nicely as you can, hey, like I know you thought I couldn't do this, but I set the subjective and I hit it. And I'm hitting the next one. Um, so, you know, I think it'd be great if you'd be willing to speak with us again because, you know, we're doing all the things that we said we've done. And if you have any other issues, like I don't know any other way to to get through that. Um, and if that doesn't answer your question, just shoot me another note on here and we'll dive back into it. So next question. Morning. Good morning. Yeah, I will go. Okay, so okay. there's another question here. What are the types of businesses more attractive to investors? Um, sorry. Yeah, what are the types of businesses that are more attractive to investors? Is another question. Yes. Um, that's a tough one to answer. I think and that really goes back to that investor thesis that we talked about. So some of them only want to see clean tech. Some of them only want to see fintech. Some of them are really interested in not technology enabled companies and more scalable, just regular network type companies. Um, there's no right or wrong answer to this. I would say the only thing that I think is constant is if the company um, can prove that it's highly scalable, I think the better off it is and can prove that it can bring the revenue back. But otherwise it's really dependent on the investor. Okay, we have another question here. How does an investor view founders failed in a startup before? I think it doesn't matter. Um, it's all about how you present yourself and what you've learned. I've seen people that dive into startup head first. So my definition of an entrepreneur is not somebody that risks everything just to be an entrepreneur or like the job title entrepreneur. It's somebody that genuinely loves living this life, that loves the risk that's associated with it, that loves fixing problems. Like me is probably angry all the time um, and is looking to, to fix something that made you mad. And look, oftentimes things fail. And if you can spin the story to say, this is why I failed, I understand and that mistake will not happen again, I think they'll love you. Um, I think if it's just I failed because, you know, everything around me was doomed to failure and it wasn't my fault, then you're probably worse off. 
So it's all about storytelling and it's all about creating that relationship with the investor. I think that a lot of them though from the short answer is if you've put the time in, if you've learned your lesson, I would almost say that having been in a startup and failed is better than having not been in a startup. So for Rain, what are the most important metrics uh, or information to have available considering the company is not yet investor ready? Um, so I can answer that from the not Rain perspective, or I can leave this to the rest of the team to talk about this from the actual Rain perspective. Gentlemen, I'll let you tell me which one is better. Now go ahead, Mike, and then I'll chime in if anything. Hmm. Okay. So just once again, I want to stress that even though I'm kind of answering for rain, I'm not speaking definitively. I'm telling you my thoughts. Um, I think if you're not, so A, if you're not investor ready, you probably aren't a fit for rain. Um, there are other programs that exist that are world bank funded and then there are non world bank funded. There's a, like a plethora of wonderful resources. Um, rain and link are really only for folks that are at the investor ready point. If you are ready to go in front of an investor, if you're not ready to go in front of an investor, generally I think we would say, wait, do not do it. But let's just say that you might be like at the precipice of investing six months out. Um, I would say those, the, the biggest metrics to have are customers that you have, readiness of product, a demo you can show, um, and then all the research that you've done, the logic that you've done. Oh, and team. So those three items that we talked about, which were the sales and customer commitment, the um, product development, and the team, I think are the most important ones that you can have, as long as you can then corroborate it with research that you've done, customers that are interested, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Gentlemen, I'll let you jump in as well if there's anything that I'm missing. Yes, so everything you said, Mike, um, because we do have, um, if everyone's familiar with the link program, we do have the IR grant, which is for those companies that Mike kind of alluded to that are on the precipice of raising investment, but maybe not quite ready, so maybe six months out. So I would say that you would really need all those things that Mike spoke about. And it would also be good if you've maybe actually started speaking with investors, even, even though it may be informally, but you have some people that maybe made some introductions and, and you've gotten some feedback. So it's good to show that you have some feedback from, from credible investors out there that you could um, provide some color on. And that will help us, you know, in the, the whole screening process to see if, okay, well, based on what the investors said, they, they may be interested six months down the road or they see a, a potential opportunity there um, to, to actually invest. So I would say everything Mike said, as well as, you know, probably having started to engage investors as well. Cool. Thank you. Um, so I think the next one, you want to dive into it? All right. So um, next one is, I'm really interested in getting some more information on setting up a board advisory committee. In addition to your advice on how to recruit, do you guys have a pool of capable people that have indicated they may want to be advisors to Caribbean businesses? Very good question. Um, Mike, I don't know if you want to jump in. I can start. Um, I would say, I would just say no. Um, I would say not no, hard no, but like that's not the approach I would use. Um, this needs to be something organic. It's not a, I'm going to email the head of Digicel uh, country X and ask them to do it. It's got to be a, a like a real relationship. So, you know, kind of a broader perspective is if you're in our network, we do have a list of mentors. Um, that have various backgrounds that could potentially become advisors of yours. But I wouldn't go about it with the, the intention of finding your advisors through that. I would go through the network that you have, the network of that network. And I, I mean, the other thing is, uh, just to go back on what I said, you could also find the people that you think would be the best fit. And if you are doing your research and if you are very intentional about it, I think you can contact those people and say, this is what I'm doing. This would be a great opportunity for me. If you were interested in joining, would you consider this? Um, so that's how I would go about doing it. All right, thanks a lot, uh, Mike. As a follow-up to the previous question, I have an established company that manufactures prefab construction materials 
I need to raise capital to keep expanding my operations in the DR and the Caribbean. Do you think that an investor would be interested in investing in this particular industry? Is raising capital for the construction industry any different from the tech industry? Mike? I'm um, sorry, I'm just rereading the question. Uh, so yeah, there's there's kind of two answers. One of them is the industry specific, and then one of them is like the sub industry. One of them is the, the broader industry. Look, I like prefab. Um, I think it's a really cool spot. I've done a lot with clean tech as well, and I think. Um, I, I would say yes. I think the short answer is yes, that's something that an investor is going to be interested in. Putting on my investor hat, my a lot of my fears are going to be your market, the size of the market, the competition in the market, and everything else. So I think if you can appropriately answer those questions, the industry itself is one I think that's actually growing. Um, and interestingly, it's growing beyond the Caribbean as well. So um, as long as you can prove that you are a unique and special snowflake, then, and I mean, I mean that not rudely, um, then you're okay. And I think it's a really interesting space to be in. Um, and I would say raising capital for the construction industry, no. Uh, I mean, you need the same things. You need to have the same processes. Um, a lot of it, like, look, you might not have a sexy app, but it doesn't change the fact that you need to know how to present, you need to know how to sell. You need to have your partners lined up and understand what's the difference between a customer and a user and everything else that goes with that. So as long as you can answer all of that, I think you're in a good spot. Um, I did see one earlier that was on social investors. Did we answer that? No, I didn't see that one. Okay. Do other things uh, you discussed apply to social investors as well? If not, what are social investors looking for? So that's a really tough one to answer, and that requires probably a long, drawn-out, intellectual kind of conversation back and forth. Because a lot of what social, there was like generation one of social investors and a lot of them were not successful. So a lot of them are really repositioning themselves on what their strategies are going to be. And I feel like we're in that in, that in between space right now. So I don't really know. Um, I think if you look at a group like the Acumen Fund, they're, they're currently reinventing themselves. There are a few others like Unreasonable and Village Capital or 1776 that there's some, they're part accelerator, part um, social investors. I would say this goes back to Crunchbase. I don't, I don't know the specifics on any of them. I think a lot of the, the basics that we talked about will, they'll want to see. I think if you have them, you're always better off. And then if social investors sometimes might be a little bit more lenient, understanding more difficult operational environments um, or business environments, and <clears throat> they're willing to get lower returns and be a little bit less sharky about it. But I think fundamentally they'll want to see the same business items. Okay, we have another one here. What are the variables for raising capital for the water sector, particularly in technology? Not sure. So um, there are really two areas for water sector. One of them is going to be water purification. Um, and that's everything from desalinization to distribution to um, wastewater treatment. And then the other one is going to be using water for energy production, which is going to be your wave technologies and your hydro technologies. Um, both of those are surprisingly similar and that they really require, they're more B to G. So you're gonna be selling, I, I'm gonna make an assumption that most of your contracts are gonna be government or that quasi public private partnership. The other thing that's gonna be really difficult with this is them getting access, your customers having access to money and the ability to pay at any given time. Um, so I would say in your case, and this is from the developing the business more than it is from the fundraising end, because think about it, the, really the fundraisers will be asking the same questions um, is, where, what does the money look like in this? So assuming you get somebody that's willing to try this out, which is in and of itself very difficult to do, oftentimes requires one to five years to build the pilot, depending on the size. Um, who's paying for it? Um, and then when are they paying for it? And then how are you tracking the results? And if you know there's a safety and a fallback, what does that look like? So for energy production, how is that gonna tie into 
the grid and the distribution centers. And if it's wave technology, you know, just the resiliencies and the fish, wildlife, and everything else. If it's wastewater treatment or desalinization, oftentimes it's about proving the technology works, going up against all the competitors that have more backing, and then getting a lot of project financing as well. So it's a very complex piece um, that really just requires you knowing your business inside and out, having like even more so than anything else, having the customers lined up and understanding the distribution end of things and making sure that you're tied in and plugged in with that with the long sales cycle. I think there was a... Um, and can, can everybody see everybody else's comments? Because Telly has been writing a lot of really wonderful comments that I think everybody should be reading that, I, that is complimenting a lot of the things that we're talking about. Yes, I see those. Can everyone see them? Uh, no. So we can find a way to to share that. Okay. All right. I think there was a question. Someone had their hand raised. I think it was Sam. I, I unmuted you, Sam. Hello. All right. Let's grab that. If you have a question, Sorry, Sam. just type it in. Sorry. Any more Actually, Telly, do you have access to the chat? Can you write some of those comments in the chat to everybody? Or let's see if we can give you access to that. I can also make Telly speak if she wants to. I can unmute Telly. You're unmuted. You are now welcome to jump in. Um, not to put you on the spot. You don't have to. Do not feel obliged to. Just in case you did want to jump in um, and write any comments, please feel free. Um, so the next one is, thank you for the answer. Are Lincoln Rain good options for social businesses seeking uh, social investors? So I do want to just touch briefly just to make sure that we're clear on this. The difference between Lincoln and Rain, because it can be a little bit confusing. Rain is essentially a list of angel investors and even VCs that we are friends with across the Caribbean um, that are interested in seeing deals. Um, and we're, you know, we're playing to some extent an advisory role or a support role or really helping if and when anybody wants any type of the help that we can provide. Um, that's really the extensive range. Link is the program where it's really entrepreneurial focused and, and supporting folks. Um, and Oftentimes what Link can do is put you in front of the RAIN network. So that being said, I would say, are we good options? Maybe. Uh, it boils, it's case by case. They, the angels might be really in, interested in what you're doing. They might not care at all. It'll really depend on, um, you know, what your vision is, what your mission is, and, you know, all the other things I talked about, but still making sure that there will be a clear return on investment for those investors. Oh, we have more questions. Um, okay, so any other questions? Not, not seeing any other written questions right now. Does anybody want to talk? Uh, do the thing, the raising hand thing, and we can talk. Said. Um, is there a price point that power production needs to meet? Oh God, that's a tough one. Um, I don't know. I think that's the easiest. Um, I, I've played in the space, but I've never crunched the numbers. So I am uncomfortable giving you an answer to that question. Um, what I can do is offline connect you with some of the people that are a little bit closer to it that can answer that. And then I think the other thing that's worth doing is just talking with the government organizations um, who will ultimately, the policymakers and the government organizations, that will be driving those decisions. And then we've got a comment from Tele under the EPIC program. We are facilitating the, via, the virtual coaching sessions for the Lean Startup Development Pre-Acceleration Program, helping digital or digital-enabled startups to go from idea to pitch. The focus is on developing high-growth ventures, which can scale. 
Um, so anybody that's interested in doing that, um, we can share that as well, kind of tell his contact information, how to get involved in that after the presentation. Um, great, thanks. Oh, deadline is today for Telly. So yeah, um, Telly, can you message us the contact information for that so we can just send it in the chat? So how do investors view seasonal services like EdTech where the windows are clearly defined? Um, so that's another really kind of complex question. I don't really know if the, the like, so generally depending on the geography and the timing and just the, the institution, it doesn't necessarily need to be seasonal. And even then, it's going to be the exact same way. Um, you know, it depends. The interesting thing about ed tech from the business end of things is you have users, you have customers, you have government organizations, you have private. I mean, depending on how complex it is, it could be a MOOC, which is just literally online sign up. Or it could be a much more complex piece where you're setting up private schools and setting up a standardized curriculum that you push out, you're training teachers and then overseeing implementation. And then the government is potentially subsidizing and then local teachers are teaching. Um, all of them really, if you have a clear defined path to market and a clear defined way to revenue, I don't think it matters if it's, if it's seasonal or not. Um, I think, you know, this, EdTech is definitely complex, but I do think that as long as you can show proof that people are willing to buy it, it doesn't matter. It, that goes back to that like cost of customer acquisition multiplied by the lifetime value. Sometimes you'll find one-time purchases that are enough. And sometimes, you know, if they you if you make them pay per year, per month that they're using it, whatever else, it could potentially definitely work. Um, and then Tilly, we are also offering a uh, follow on bootcamp in Barbados, St. Lucia and St. Kitts and Nevis, focusing on MVP development and key traction metrics required by investors. It is a two day bootcamp. All right, I'll tell you what Tilly, it might be best if you email us the, con the information and we'll forward that along with this slide deck. All right, let's say two more questions. It's almost 11.30. Um, we've taken enough of your time today. So anything else that you have questions on, feedback on, concerns, emotional outbursts, what else can we do for you? Right, so um, what I'm gonna do is we're gonna convert the uh, recorded session into a YouTube video and I'll send the link out to everyone. The, the link for the previous webinar is up on the Link Caribbean website on the resources page. So you could go and take a look at that if you did not get a chance to um, take part in the first webinar that we had. Um, so I'll send out that link and I'll also send you the information from Telly and along with the presentation from today. And be on the lookout, we will also be, as I said, this is the first in a series of ones that we're looking to do. So um, we'll continue sending out webinar flyers. Um, once you're registered for one, then you'll get the flyers for any others that we have. So thanks again for everyone's time for joining us on this Friday morning. And yeah, we'll be in touch. Um, look out for those emails from us. Thanks a lot. Thank everybody. you all so much. I really hope this was useful for everybody. Um, and I definitely look forward to chatting with people in the future. I don't know if my contact information is in there, but as you have questions, trust me, I'm, I'm all over the place. So chances are we will end up speaking at some point. All right. Thanks, Mike. Cheers. All right, take care, everyone. Have a good weekend.